politics brings together people who might not normally hang out on the weekends. For instance, in the past, conservative and liberal churches have teamed up with bars and horse racing tracks to fight casinos. There's another unlikely teaming up going on to take the battle over whether the public-private entity Jobs Ohio is a legal constitutional creation to the Ohio Supreme Court. The Democrat and union-backed group Progress Ohio has had lawsuits against Jobs Ohio tossed out of two courts on the grounds that the group has no standing to sue. Those rulings have raised the hackles of the Tea Party-backed group, the 1851 Center for Constitutional Law, an offshoot of the conservative think tank, the Buckeye Institute. Activists from that group are now joining Progress Ohio in asking the state's high court to hear their arguments over Jobs Ohio. And the issue behind that lawsuit that Progress Ohio put together got a new push this week when it was announced that Commerce Director David Goodman refused to sign the Jobs Ohio transfer agreement until the Ohio Supreme Court rules on constitutionality. Goodman says he's confident the program is legal, but he says it's not his call to make. Here to talk about their unusual partnership are Brian Rothenberg from Progress Ohio and Maurice Thompson from the 1851 Center for Constitutional Law. So how did this teaming up happen? Who came to who and said, let's work together to get our interests, our common interests before the Ohio Supreme Court? Well, I, Maurice sent me an email and then I sent it to our attorneys to look at it. But you know, the, the, the really key thing here is this is really about something larger than just Jobs Ohio, although I think I have definite concerns about Jobs Ohio, and I'll let Maurice speak to his concerns about it. But this case says that nobody has the right to sue over an unconstitutional provision. There is no court that's actually ruled on Jobs Ohio that what they've essentially said is we didn't have the right to sue. And that leaves your, def your constitution defenseless. Basically, what it <coughs> says is you can have an unconstitutional provision out there and no one can sue to make sure that it's constitutional. And when your constitution is left in shreds, then what does it mean? I know you're concerned about that. Well, and that's right. And I read the decision in, in Brian's case, the Progress Ohio Challenge to Jobs Ohio, and I was just shocked by the nature of the decision because we've been slowly drifting away from taxpayer standing in Ohio over the last decade or so. And each case has gotten worse and worse to the point where we're just slamming the door on Ohioans defending their constitution in court. And this this was the case that took the cake. It was absolutely the worst case on standing I've ever read, and it paid no homage to the Ohio Constitution, only really acknowledged the federal Constitution, which is a huge problem because the two are different on standing. So as soon as I finished reading that case, I, I found Brian's email address, which I only had because it was a, a CC'd on a case that he had sued me on before, on the Healthcare Freedom Amendment, so that's the only reason I had his uh, address. I, um, I emailed him and said, look, I don't know if you guys are planning on appealing this, but we'll do whatever we can to make sure you do because this decision can't stand as it is. And let me ask you about this lack of standing issue. This was not the first time you've been concerned about this, Brian. In fact, you hosted the conservative Ohio Roundtable when they came down to Columbus to react to a lawsuit in which they had sued over the Racinos at Scioto Downs and other places. Right. And once again, that case was thrown out of court for lack of standing. Well, yeah, Rob Walgate and David Zanotti's group up in the Cleveland area um, is a very conservative group, but you know um, we actually agree with them as well about the the concerns over the lottery and and all of a sudden the lottery being allowed to allow these games a chance that are happening at all these racetracks wasn't allowed when we voted that in, but all of a sudden now it's it's acceptable to have all these slot machine type activities going on at these racetracks. Um, why? Because somehow there was a way to get around the Constitution. This is not just a, a, a Republican or Democratic or progressive in my case or in conservative type of issue. What's really happening here is the inability of anybody to sue over unconstitutional provisions. And in the case of Jobs Ohio, it makes it even worse because they knew it. And what they wrote into the legislation was you had to sue within the first 90 days. Now, in order to have standing, you're supposed to be able to show some kind of harm. Jobs Ohio didn't exist because it wasn't created after 90 days. If you can't sue after 90 days when Jobs Ohio exists, there's no way to have standing. Now, the idea of standing, though, Maurice, if anybody has standing, then everybody has standing. And couldn't that potentially bring the whole court system and state government to a halt if everybody can sue over every program they don't like or every bill that they disagree with? 
Well, not really. And the special thing about this case is it's kind of unique. So a normal case where you have standing concerns would be a property rights case, for example, where they're going to, say, demolish a house or regulate a certain piece of property. And the standing rule kicks in to say, well, look, um, person A's property is being regulated. That doesn't mean that person B or person C who lives a mile away can bring a lawsuit about person A's property. That makes total sense. Where we get into trouble when we talk about standing, particularly under the Ohio Constitution, is when we talk about these really unique provisions we have in the Ohio Constitution that prevent things like the auto bailouts or the bank bailouts. They prohibit corporate welfare. They prohibit spending in aid of, of private corporations and spending beyond certain debt limits. And the question is, who is really harmed by that, and who has standing to enforce that? Well, it used to be the case in Ohio consistently that everybody had a personal stake, as it was considered, in enforcement of the state constitution and in living under a government that adheres to, the, to that. And, you know, I don't think this would open the floodgates if every Ohioan can protect these great provisions in Article 8 and Article 13, because you've got to still have the resources to get to court and you've got to care enough to bring a meritorious case. So I think that kind of floodgates argument uh, is really a kind of a Pyrrhic argument, but moreover, that's a utilitarian argument. And where we have a problem is we see judges making this utilitarian argument, oh, there'd be too many cases. It's not your job to limit the number of cases in courts. There's nothing in the Ohio Constitution that authorizes you to impose your value judgment against a bunch of cases in court. Instead, what you have to do is enforce its terms. And instead, what these judges have done is taken a black magic marker and essentially redacted, written Article 8 all the way out of the Constitution, written Article 13 out of the Constitution, because if Progress Ohio can't enforce those terms in this case, then no Ohioan has a sufficiently personal stake to enforce those terms ever. Do you feel like this is a growing problem, this issue of lack of standing? I do, and, and not only do I think it's a growing problem, I think it's a danger when you have a breathing, living document like a Constitution and you have reasons that these provisions were put in. In this case, it was because when the canals were built in the 1840s and a lot of private public money went into these private corporations, there was a huge scandal in Ohio, which is why they then enacted these laws to not allow public money in a private institution. Um, suddenly, all of a sudden, you've got, a, the court has never ruled on that provision. I mean, it basically said you can't sue. And so what good is the provision in the Constitution if you can't sue to make sure that it's upheld? Now, you also agree on the idea that Jobs Ohio itself is an unconstitutional entity, though you might have different reasons for why you feel that way, or well, do you? Let me, let me check you a little bit on that statement. I think that at this point in the litigation, we're agnostic as to whether Jobs Ohio is constitutional or not. Our position is uh, a strong one in support of Progress Ohio on standing, and we are analyzing their claims on Jobs Ohio. I think that lots of people who understand the Ohio Constitution are suspicious of Jobs Ohio and had those suspicions um, since the beginning. And that includes our group. Um, but at, at this point, we haven't yet taken a position on the substance and on the merits of the case. So if it goes to the Ohio Supreme Court, you won't necessarily be on Progress Ohio's side once it gets there, if it gets past the lack of standing issue. We're going to see what issues the court accepts. We, we are fighting for their right to be in court, irrespective of how good their argument is. Um, but we will look at how good their argument is um, if the court takes one of those issues. And you do, Brian, though, believe this is an unconstitutional well, I think exercise. It's, I think it's pretty simple. The, the fact of the matter is the Constitution doesn't allow, allow for public money in a private corporation. Jobs Ohio is a private corporation. Um, that's the main issue here. They can't get around it. So rather than get around it, they've been trying to play legal games and judicial games to never have any court rule on the issue of whether it's legal or not. Right now, I just want them to rule. For one thing, we have all kinds of tax money, uh, all kinds of these liquor money transfers going in there, all kinds of other monies now going in from the third frontier and, and other ways that are now flowing through Jobs Ohio and how Jobs Ohio is divvying these up to regional development corporations. Millions and millions of dollars with little oversight. You look at this partnership and think, is there hope for bipartisanship because you two come from very different perspectives, or is it because you're both so far on your own perspectives that you've met on the other side? I mean, is the, do you bring hope for bipartisanship, or are you just so extreme that you've met on the far end? <laughs> I think um, corporate welfare is an issue where that circle is a better is a better illustration than the continuum of uh, of political philosophies. We're very libertarian. 
Um, and so we, we think government should treat people equally, and we don't think that they should redistribute wealth. So we do disagree on, on those issues, um, but where it comes back around is where they're redistributing wealth to, to maybe particular groups. Brian might support certain kinds of redistribution and not others, and we support no kinds of redistribution of wealth. So when we look at Jobs Ohio, um, we say, well, we had this Department of Development that wasn't working. Um, what we want to do is go the other way. Instead of this uh, burgeoning private corporation that's going to pick winners and losers in the marketplace with public money, what we want is lower tax rates across the board for big businesses and small businesses, create a level playing field, and then allow people to succeed on their own merits instead of through a big helping hand from the big brother. And what we want uh, <laughs> is actually uh, uh, not having anyone pick or choose anymore with these things, having transparency. I think we agree on transparency issues. This isn't the first time Progress Ohio has wound up working with groups that are um, on the conservative side. We've also been opposed to casino gaming and uh, there were a couple other issues that we've joined in. But the important thing here is that you keep dialogue with people even if you disagree with them at certain times. And um, as Maurice and I have talked about, sometimes some of the groups that were opposed to the war that I worked with back in you know, 2006, um, when we were opposing escalation in Iraq, I now, when I go to talk to Tea Party places where I'm usually booed talking about health care issues, uh, but many of those people that work with me on the anti-war stuff are actually in the audience and come over and talk to me. I think it's a generational thing for me. I, you know, I'm, I'm really pleased that Maurice can sort of reach across the aisle and do this, but back in, you know, back in the 80s and 90s when I first came down to the State House, you were able to talk even if you disagreed with people, and uh, it's much more polarized here in this town right now. Um, just like it's polarized in Washington, but I've always sort of maintained that discussion. You know, and on an issue like this, the defending the state constitution is so much larger than any one political person or figure. So this isn't a lawsuit that's out to get the Kasich administration or anything like that. The Article 8 and Article 13, these are important structural limitations on government that defend us from a runaway government like we have, we think we have at the federal level. And these, these things have been around for 160 years and they hopefully will be around for another 160 years, far after the, the current administration is out of office. And if we can't get these things under control, then any administration could abuse these powers in the future too. So that's what people need to understand. This isn't a Republican versus a Democrat thing. These are structural provisions that protect us all and are bigger than any one uh, candidate or public official. While you're both here, I want to ask you questions about some things that you don't necessarily agree on. And Brian, you kind of opened the door here with yeah. the Affordable Care Act. Uh, sure. I want to ask you, um, are you in the position to take any more action mm -hmm. with regard to what the state is doing about setting up a state insurance exchange, which uh, is in the Affordable Care Act? And Maurice, you had said that your organization might sue if the state did under the Health Care Freedom Amendment that was passed in November. So I want to talk a little bit about what's happening with that. We'll probably be on opposite sides of this, but you know, I, I have been encouraged that by the governor's statements and, and Mr. Moody's statements that they're considering the Medicaid expansion. I think Greg it's Moody important. From the Greg of Moody from the Health office. Of, right. And I, I am encouraged by that. What I am a little disturbed about is it seems like our lieutenant governor would rather play politics on this issue and is taking a very political stance. Um, you know, using inflammatory language, and it seems like that there's a divide in the governor's office because of that. And I really wish that the lieutenant governor would understand that this is about people's health. It's it's you know, and and it's about um, giving Ohioans a say and a right in designing how this is going to work, um, as opposed to playing pure political games because it's a political season. Well, and of course, we don't agree with any of that at all. <laughs> um, the the issue with the state-run exchange is absolutely huge for Ohioans. And the reason it's not a political issue and it's not about state autonomy is because when a state runs up, uh, signs up for an Obamacare exchange, they sign up to be subject to any law or regulation passed by HHS in D.C. and by Kathleen Sebelius. So essentially, uh, the state would be serving us up on a silver platter to any kind of regulation, irrespective of whether it's a state or a federal exchange. So the notion of a, of a state-run exchange being more independent is really pyrrhic when you actually look at the law. And so what we say is what is the best thing we can do for Ohio? And that continues to be health care freedom and to limit the scope and effectiveness of Obamacare 
in Ohio and to limit its, its crushing effect on health care choice and options. And we do that through making it more difficult to enforce Obamacare through not giving in on a state exchange. And actually, as it turns out, the uh, premium assistance and the, the $3,000 a year tax on employers that would kick in on an Ohio business owners is only possible under a state-run exchange. So Ohio can fight against those kinds of provisions uh, by avoiding this state-run exchange. And also, we believe that it violates the terms of the Ohio Constitution under the Health Care Freedom Amendment. So if the state did go ahead and go through with a state-run exchange, you would fight it in court? We would bring a lawsuit. The, um, the exchange is required to be set up in January of 2014. It doesn't look like that timeline is going to be met at this point. Um, so it's unclear what the administration is going to do. Uh, we are strongly suggesting they not set up a, an exchange and also strongly suggesting that we do not have the money to expand Medicaid. And finally, I want to ask you, Maurice, uh, the 1851 Center for Constitutional Law is working with a group in Westerville, just north of Columbus, that is trying to take a tax levy that was passed in March back to the ballot for repeal. And this is the first time you've been working with a group like that. And I'm just wondering why. Sure. Um, we have found that the playing field between taxpayers and tax raisers at the local level, particularly on school district issues, is not even remotely close to even. Um, these taxpayers fight against these levies. They try to recommend spending cuts that their districts can make in order to be more fiscally responsible. And they just get beat over the head with this, it's for the kids mantra, no matter how much the administrators and uh, the teachers and other school employees are making, which is 90% of a school's costs. Um, and so what we have a real problem with in Ohio is right now um, a school board can bring a levy up to three times per year to raise your taxes. And you can say no, 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 five times over the course of two years. And then they get you on the sixth time at a special election where the voter turnout is low. And that's what the, the special interest groups and the lobbyists that advise these school districts actually tell them to do, is to put this on at an August election when nobody votes or a March of election when the, the turnout is low. What we ultimately want is one election per year to determine your tax rate, the November election when everybody votes, give everybody an opportunity to vote. That's when they show up. Um, and what we also want to do is level the playing field in the interim, give people a tool to fight back and keep more of the money that they actually earned. And Westerville is a great place to do that because the school officials up there are paid extremely well, as well as anywhere in central Ohio. And it would make more sense for them to at least not take pay increases than to pass that on to the struggling taxpayers. So this is not going to be the last time you're going to be involved in something like this? We hope to use this in as many places as we can around the state. And Brian, any thoughts on well, a lot, of this, kind of a lot of this has been brought in, this wrath has been brought down from the Kasich administration and the draconian cuts that they've had. And uh, it is for the kids because right now uh, all of these cuts are going to start to affect people in a very major way, both at the school level and in local government levels. And, um, you know, we've got a situation here where we've got excess money. The governor refuses to uh, give any relief to these local governments. And I think that this year is where it's really going to be felt, the lack of local government funding. But indeed, you've had uh, levies, especially this past week, 70% of them failed. So a That's lot of people correct. are very frustrated this with is, levies This is in going general. to be the, the year, mm -hmm. the, the tax Mageddon year, where all of these cuts That's that true. Kasich has, has reigned on the local level are going to start to be felt at the local level. And people are going to either <clears> realize <throat> their police, their fire, their schools, they're all going to go through these cuts, or they're going to have to raise local taxes. And that's what happens when you're the governor and you want to say that you cut taxes, but you really didn't. You just pushed them onto local government. Yeah, I, I, I want to agree with um, some of the sentiments that Brian has expressed there in that um, the Strickland administration's state budgets were actually much smaller than the Kasich administration's state budget, um, which kind of shows maybe the, the value of split government versus one party control. We saw that in Washington as well. So what the administration's last budget did was uh, dramatically increase the size of state government. And in order to do that, they cut the assistance to local governments. And while it didn't nominally raise taxes, the effect is to push all of those cuts down to the local level. Where exactly that's right. We're having Armageddon at the local level over whether to, whether to raise taxes, not at the local level. So, so, you know, John, maybe the Kasich administration hasn't raised taxes per se, but they've given the matches over 
to the local governments that are letting people's pocketbooks on fire today. Even though the governor has urged local governments not to put levies well, on the ballot, not to raise local taxes. You know, you can say that, but what he's done is the exact opposite. You know, it would have made more sense to continue that local government assistance and reduce state government in, in order to avoid a tax increase or to cut taxes where he has control, which is at the state level, to make it even. Well, we end on agreement between you two. That's so great. <laughs> Brian Rothenberg for Progress Ohio, Maurice Thompson from the 1851 Center for Constitutional Law. Thank you very much.